in the early days of the railroading, when schedules were more casual and division points were smaller, frequent stops for water posed no great problem. But when speed became paramount and runs became longer, frequent visits for water became problematic, mainly when intense competition existed between two railroads. The solution was to devise a method for moving trains to take water at speed. But did it actually work? Find out by watching this video. In 1860, the London and North Western Railway developed the first water trough, or track band sometimes called track tanks, a device to enable a steam locomotive to recharge its water supply while in motion. It was a long trough filled with water lying between the rails. When a steam locomotive passed over the track, a water scoop was lowered, and the speed of forward motion forced water into the scoop up the scoop pipe and into the tank's cistern or locomotive tender. The New York Central at Montrose, NY, was the first U.S. railroad to embrace that technology in 1870. The Pennsylvania Railroad followed in 1872. The track bands were about a quarter of a mile long and six or seven inches deep, from which water was taken at a speed of about 35 to 45 miles per hour. Steam was piped in at 40 or 50 foot intervals to prevent the water from freezing in the winter. By 1919, PRR installed track bands on the following divisions. New York, Trenton, Philadelphia, Middle, Maryland, Pittsburgh, and Atlantic, but oddly, not system-wide. Despite the stated benefits, most U.S. railroads did not follow the NYC or PRR. Examples and only the New Haven and the B and O Reading New Jersey Central Royal Blue Line were so equipped. NYC, the prime competitor of the PRR, utilized tracks more consistently and intelligently, covering the main line between Harmon, NY, and Chicago. The Royal Blue Line trains competed with the PRR between Washington and New York. Accordingly, the fastest service was required. The Milwaukee Road had one short-lived experiment with track tanks but elected not to embrace the concept. It took skill for the locomotive fireman to take water on the fly. The fireman would watch for a disc and a marker light, which was the signal to lower the scoop. In the early days, the scoop itself was activated by gear and chain. Later, the air was used to power the scoop. At the end of the track tank, another disc and marker light were installed, and an inclined plane was to ensure the scoop would rise by the end of the tank. A safety lock on the tender prevented the scoop from dropping and getting cart on crossing planks or cattle guards. Expense and the need to justify track pans was the drawback that prevented widespread applications. In addition to the pans, other requirements include traditional stand pipes, Belgian block beneath the roadbed for drainage, and one or two water towers needed to ensure an adequate reservoir of water, and those were in turn refilled by tapping a nearby stream. A stationary boiler and pump house were also required to maintain water pressure and to prevent the pipes from freezing in winter. Finally, an operator was needed 24-7 set each installation. In addition to supporting the boiler pressure and the pump, the operator also was required to remove debris from the track band to prevent such material from being scooped up into the tender cistern, where it could eventually clog the water line between the locomotive and tender. The Cyclopedia of Civil Engineering, published in 1917, states that track pans must be constructed on tangent, level track, but the PRR designed several uncurves with super elevation. Of those, the curved track pan at Radnor, PA, was most frequently photographed. Track pans were comparatively expensive to build and operate compared to simple water towers and standpipes. A World War I estimate was $10,000 to $12,000 to construct those facilities and annual operating expenses of $1,500 to $2,000, excluding salaries. Seldom modeled track bands offered challenges and could elevate the accuracy of modeling a prototype operation in either the steam era or transition era of 1945 to 1955. What are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comments section down below. If you enjoyed today's video and found it interesting, then make sure to leave us a thumbs up 
and do not forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon to be always updated with the most exciting content as soon as it's uploaded. Thanks for watching. See you again soon in another video.